Good afternoon. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Kimpani. Welcome once again to the show. I'm calling this month State Senate Month uh, because I'm very excited and thrilled to have as my guest today, Senator Willis Barrow. Thank you for joining the show. Aloha, Carl. Thank you for having me. So thrilled to have you here today because there's a lot to talk about. Um, there's a lot going on in the state at the moment, and there's also an election cycle coming up. Yes. So what? Uh, so of the things coming up, we've got uh, the special session coming up for the rail. We can talk about that a bit, but I would like to talk about that from the perspective of the upcoming election cycle. So there has been some talk and some rumors about a number of different people. Last week we had Senator Josh Green on talking about his plan uh, that he's about 90% sure he's going to be running for lieutenant governor. Um, there's been a lot of talk about yourself. And so I would like to give you the opportunity to tell us what your thoughts are on that, and then we can go from there. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate it. Uh, this is my, believe it or not, 26th year in government. I worked eight years under the administration of Mayor Frank Fossey, and this is now my 18th year in the state legislature. Three years in the House and 15 plus in the Senate. Okay, so all, all in the same location, I uh, meaning all out, out in the Eva area where, yes, where you're from? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So as I look at the, I guess the second half of my career, you know, I'm 56 now, and deciding, you know, what will the next 10 years, 20 years be for myself. And I've always thought of the possibility of running for a higher office, governor or lieutenant governor. And with Shan Tatsui, the current lieutenant governor, thinking of stepping down next year to run for the uh, Maui mayorship, Maui mayor. um, there is an opportunity uh, being presented to myself and others for that matter. Um, I'd say at this stage, um, well above 50-50 that we will be running for this race. Excellent. I'm so. doing my due diligence, talking to supporters and friends and others, and, and I feel I have uh, the leadership skills, the background and experience, and, and the uh, enthusiasm and the desire to, to serve our state, to work with individuals like you and others, and to, to leave a, a positive legacy for our children and for future generations. Uh, it's, it's getting pretty tough out there. We're becoming a state of haves and have-nots. It's true. That's and very true. Um, and that's been a growing thing, actually, for decades. Yes. And true. And, and certainly, um, now is the time to, to step up to the plate and to you know, share and work with others in terms of ideas and thoughts. Uh, you talk about the rail. Uh, we are going into possible special session next month, the end of... The end of next month. Yes, yeah. end of August. And, um, you know, this is about uh, a plan for the future. Right. You know, many of us are, are angry and mad at the cost of this rail. You know, it was sold to us at three, four billion. Now we're hearing possibly eight to ten billion, and uh, uh, many voters are extremely angry and frustrated. But now, when, when you look at what this is about, it's about transportation, infrastructure, and mobility. Uh, in the next 50 years, there's going to be maybe 500,000 new residents on Oahu. And, you what know, is that based on? Um, just just the, the regular um, you know, uh, 10, what is it, 20,000 at least. Every 10 years. Every 10 years. Yes, that yes. Increase. Got it. Exactly. Okay. Uh, okay. And thus, in uh, 100 years, our population is going to double. So we need to find ways to get individuals out of their vehicles, out of their cars, because we really don't have enough space for new right. highways. Right. From a transportation perspective, that's called, uh, we need to come up with a multimodal transportation model. Uh, to include, uh, which is what we've got the, the Bicky bikes out there at the moment. Right. Uh, having a rail in place and eventually having rail spurs to go off in other directions. Exactly. Uh, uh, potentially bringing back a super ferry, an uh, inter and intra island options there, uh, finding mo many more ways to get people around the island and islands right. uh, rather than what we just currently have now. And when you're looking at 20 rail stations, now you're looking at transit-oriented development, TODs, and those TODs are going to be key to 
building housing, high density communities, and this is where many of the 500,000, 1 million new residents I speak of will be living, especially when you want to keep the country country. You've heard that mantra many times. Absolutely. And it's uh, then building along the southern urban core. Which is one of the huge benefits and purposes for, for having the rail certainly where it's going at the moment as well. We, we know we have a housing shortage. Right. And so there's a number of people who currently live here who are looking for, who need a place to live, who are looking for opportunities to even grow in, in, in a place that they're living in. Um, and just having more units available can also help with the cost right. of that as well. So number one, it's coming in and coming up with, okay, well, how are we uh, dealing with the affordable housing portion of it? Just new housing is one thing, but having it be affordable, uh, talking about whether it's rent controlled options or, or anything along those lines to help the current local people find better ways uh, to advance their lives. Right, and the state, uh, we are the biggest landowner along the rail. Yeah. When you look at the Mayor Wright Evole project, which is going to be on Liliha and King Street, um, from 350 units to 2,500 units, that's going to be the first TOD project. And then other state properties include UH West Oahu, the stadium, and eventually Leeward Community College and Honolulu Community College. So there's going to be m many opportunities for the state to um, get into building affordable rentals. That's an area that I'm looking at now. We've had some hearings, and, and there's a, a, a major demand for affordable rentals, as you know, especially at the lower end for the, you know, the poor, the low income. And, and really, if government doesn't take the initiative, you know, the private sector will not. They, they won't, because it's about their bottom line. It's about exactly. what they're returning. And they're looking at more, if anything, workforce housing, um, whereas the, the low income, you know, the poor, the Section 8 type individuals, you know, they need some subsidies and government assistance. They, they definitely do. Uh, th that's a whole other topic, and I would love to actually have an entire episode talking about we housing. That, yeah. And so I would love to invite you back for that to talk about just that. Um, but let, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's, uh, you talked about 26 years in elected office, starting in city council. And then going through well, 18 and elected eight years with Mayor Foss. Oh, there you go. Right. There you go. Okay. Please uh, um, just elaborate more. Tell us a bit about the time you spent under Mayor Fossey, and then when you in the, the, the House seat that you had. Tell us about that, and then how you transitioned into Senate. And you're currently the Vice President of the Senate, correct? I'm I'm the Majority Floor Leader. Majority Floor Leader. But I'm chairing the Housing Committee, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Transportation Committee. Excellent. Okay. So I used to be the Vice President, but when I was the Vice President, I didn't have a chairmanship. Got it. So I was so offered now you get to dig into issues. Exactly. Now Excellent. I get to Good. get into the housing, which is you know uh, one of the major issues of our time. Um, but I, I started out under Frank Fossey. He hired me when I was 26 years old put me in charge of Oahu's neighborhood board system. Okay. Yeah. So that was a great opportunity. I'm very um, young and enthusiastic and bright-eyed. I got to meet people all over the island from Waianae to Waikiki, North Shore, um, South Shore, everything in between, um, and a, a, an opportunity to see uh, democracy and grassroots government you know, at, at its best. Now, I know sometimes some of these neighborhood board meetings can be pretty contentious and, and wild, <laughs> uh, but, but generally speaking, um, board members do have their community's interest at heart. Uh, they want to do what they feel is best, and, and it's a great opportunity for local community residents to interact with elected officials such as myself and other government officials. It's a great place to make sure that the community is having its voice heard. Right. And, uh, with the issues that are coming up. So I, I'm all for that. I currently sit on, on my neighborhood board. This is my second term just elected. And that's the, for me, that's the most important part of it is when we hear from the community members, when we talk with them, and we're able to then convey the information and have a good conversation in those meetings and even outside of those meetings about the issues with our various elected officials to help solve problems. In uh, 1999, my state representative back then, Paul Oshiro, he resigned midterm and uh, took a job with the private sector. And at that time, I was fortunate enough to be appointed by then Governor Ben Cayetano 
to fill the remainder the of the seat. Okay. Yes. Wh which house seat was that? Um, Ebba Beach. Ebba Beach. Okay. Basically, yeah, Ebba yeah. Beach, why I'm part of Waipahu. Got it, okay. Um, but now I just represent Ebba Beach because of reapportionment. Re right. And as my district has grown population-wise, geographically it has shrunk, again, because of more density. Right. So I was in the House for three years, and then I ran for the State Senate, and I was, again, very privileged to win election in 2002. Was that an open seat? It was an open um, due to reapportionment. Reapportionment right. it was an open seat, so a new one opened up, yeah. and so that you had to run against a few people then. Right, right. And, um, you know, thank goodness I am here now. I've been here since. And, you know, over the years I've, I've chaired um, public safety, intergovernmental military affairs, um, economic development, and now I'm doing housing. And I've had a, a wonderful career and a, a great opportunity to, to help with many issues. Um, I'm proud to say that I have had 95 bills passed uh, since my uh, beginning, and I'm hoping That's with one more something. term left to, to try to hit that magic number of 100 bills. Oh, 100 bills. Yes. Wow, um, there's an achievement. So Put that up on the wall. It, it's possible, I think, if we could get five bills. Sure. Um, sure over sure. the years, I've you know, it's been anywhere from three or four to, to eight or ten bills a year. So it, it adds up over the years. Absolutely. Oh, that's and, great. And, uh, you know, if I can take what I've learned in the state legislature and uh, then transfer that to the fifth floor to the lieutenant governor, I think that would be a, a wonderful opportunity to continue working for the people of Hawaii, yeah. but basically at a different level. Yeah. And yeah. To, um, to use, you know, my... Uh, soapbox on the issues that I've been working for over the years. Uh, yeah. um, currently, um, police reform. Uh, that was going to be one of the things. You, I know you and I have had conversations right. about criminal justice reform and uh, really everything surrounding the prisons and, and right. a whole other area that exactly. you talk about. Uh, as well. That's another show I would love to do. Yeah. Uh, and well. build, building an aerospace industry. Uh, next year, there's a strong possibility Hawaii will get a spaceport license from the FAA, and Kona Airport on the Big Island uh, will be de designated as a, a spaceport site if that approval process goes as planned, wow. and, and thus creating a new industry, space tourism, uh, a niche market where individuals will be able to fly into lower Earth orbit, um, feel wow. weightlessness and come back. Uh, it's a niche market. No one's doing it yet. How long has that been under development? Oh, uh, probably a good four or five years at least. That's um, wow. And there are companies out there who have expressed an interest in coming to Hawaii and, and setting up shop. Well, and, yeah, uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk, I know that they're uh, very interested in trying to do that. Uh, and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Virgin Galactic. Virgin, right? that's right, that's right. right. That's um, right. Brant, uh, Richard Branson. Richard Branson, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and there's a few others. So yeah. we're hoping that that is one of the um, aerospace initiatives that gets off the ground soon. And, and even this right. year, we are funding a study uh, to do possibly small satellite launches, too, out of Hawaii. Because wow. Uh, w this is the perfect place to launch small satellites because you could do an equatorial launch towards the equator or you can do one uh, north. Uh, I forgot the term, <laughs> but in the other direction sure. um, from the big island. A and with the ocean around you, you don't have the problem of anything going astray and hitting civilians or cities. So, right, 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 so there's right, a right. few endeavors. Definitely, uh, definitely, um, definitely we're a leader probably. in unmanned aerial systems. We're one of seven test sites in the nation for unmanned aerial systems and trying to develop that industry, uh, which is in its um, infancy as well, where you see um, uses not only for recreational, but, but in business, oh, in government. I know, exactly. Uh, I know that a lot of the work that I've been doing lately, we've been using uh, the drones uh, to help us get 3D imaging of, of buildings and facilities as we try to, because we, we build TV systems. Exactly. So. There's so much that yeah. you can do with drones, but, you know, the, 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 the population is concerned about the, 
the privacy issue and making sure people aren't spying and Absolutely. peeping toms. But we already have laws in place for that. Right. Uh, but uh, we have to allay their fears, and this is something, a discussion that's going on locally as well as nationally, as you know. It definitely is. It definitely is. So yeah. uh, it's time for a break. Yeah. So again, thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Mover, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. Once again, thank you to our guest, Senator Willis Barrow. And when we return, we're going to talk a bit more about the LG race and the ideas that are going to be put forward and maybe some platform thoughts. So we'll see. We'll see you in a minute. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. Once again, we are having a great conversation with Senator Willis Barrow. Once again, thank you for the show. Thank Welcome. You. And so let's now dig in to the Lieutenant Governor race. Okay. You're saying you're above 50% thinking that, uh, that you're going to be running next year. Uh, that will be kicking off probably much sooner than next year um, as that really begins. But uh, tell us, start by telling us what you've what you perceive the role of lieutenant governor to be, to be, and then what you would want to do as lieutenant governor. Sure, thank you, Carl. Well, the lieutenant governor uh, is there to support the governor. Um, he's the number two person, and when the governor is not in office, the lieutenant governor takes over, um, temporarily, of course. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm willing and able to work with any governor any Democratic governor uh, who will uh, be in office. Uh, there are so many issues impacting us. As I mentioned to you earlier, we're becoming a state of haves and have-nots. And you know, two of the biggest issues I'd like to continue working on that I'm working on now, for example, are housing and transportation. Um, we're, we're going through this pivot, in my opinion. It's, it's a 10-year pivot in terms of um, where we're going to um, develop housing, how quickly we're going to be able to develop it, and you know, we're looking at elderly housing, housing for our young families, ha housing for, for the low income, and housing for the middle class. Uh, we need to uh, set some policies, provide incentives for developers where we can. The state owns a lot of land where we might be able to provide that very cheaply or at low cost. Um, transportation, you know, we're not only talking about the rail, you mentioned it earlier, it's a multimodal approach. Um, carpooling, um, bicycling, walking, um, maybe in some cases doing more telecommuting uh, um, because of technology. Uh, there's no reason why every home cannot have a, a computer, a scanner, printer, um, Skyping um, ability where you can literally talk face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, and as our population grows, the transportation infrastructure, um, do we um, build new roads? Do we widen roads? Do we double deck? How are we going to get people from point A to point B? Because Efficiently and safely, right? Exactly. Because right now, for example, with a population of close to a million people, we've got almost a million cars 
yeah, that are registered. This is just on Oahu. Right. right. Now imagine mm -hmm. an additional 500,000 people. Does that mean there can be an additional 300 or 400,000 cars? We have to find ways to get people out of their cars. And that's not accounting for the tourists and the car rentals. Exactly. And thus, you can see where um, if we're stagnant, if we have traffic congestion, if people are basically in a parking lot, so to speak, on the roads, um, it can be detrimental to our economy. You know, it can hurt small businesses. Uh, we need to make certain that as we plan for the future, you know, we look at what's right for not only five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, at the rail, you're looking at a, a structure that's going to probably be around for the next 100, 200 years. You're looking at a right of way that'll be around for the next 300, 400 years if humanity survives that long. And we're talking future, future <laughs> generations. Not to mention um, the climate change effects that are coming in. But you know, it's, it's an issue that we do have to tackle and hopefully in the special session we'll come up with some legislation that you know, I'm thinking possibly not only the general excise tax, that half percent, that most of us really aren't feeling right now, but also having the tourists um, pay more. Uh, they do pay the general excise tax, but the how do we do that? Well, the idea of the, the TAT, the hotel tax, okay, yeah, ha yeah. has come up. So, okay. so you can see a potential hybrid there. Uh, I even think that in the future we should look at maybe um, advertising, you know, on the on the rail uh, structure itself, because there is room where you could put small signage. And that Absolutely. you could sell and, and give that back to, to the people in terms of uh, um, maybe subsidizing uh, um, rides for low income or the elderly or whatever the case is. Everything to help operational costs. Exactly. So they're, they're, yeah. That's definitely used in, in other cities that have rail systems where you've got a range of that. We can't put billboards up. We're mm -hmm. not currently allowed to put billboards up, but we can certainly put signage up in various locations and we can utilize that. Um, and from what I understand, a lot of the stations are going to have monitors, TV monitors as well. And that can be used in various ways to support. By the way, you're, you're on your way into Waikiki. Were you aware of that? Right. You can visit this and this and so forth. So right. Well, I do expect that the rail transit will become a destination. So for the tourists that come into town, one of the things the concierge will say is, oh, go ride the rail because you could probably ride it for X amount all day and, and literally um, go from Kaligi to Kapolei, UH Manoa one day, to UH West Oahu, right. and everything in between right. on one ticket. That's the value of the rail system. Absolutely. And right. people don't have to worry about parking or gasoline yeah. or other problems that could be associated with, with owning and, and using a vehicle. Definitely. And it also adds to that, let's go back to the TOD conversation. With that, you've got each stop. So, you know what, we're going to take a stop off in Kalihi at the moment because there's been a development in Kalihi. Certainly, you know, if something happens with OCCC and that whole area gets redeveloped into you know, a, a multi-use, uh, uh, I guess, residential and, and, and commercial center, if, which some people talk about, it becomes a destination. So I want to take the rail from Ala Moana or from Waikiki to Kalihi area because I want to go visit the stores and the shops in that quaint little area that, that has its own cultural feel as well. So that, that itself, so the sort of transit-oriented development that can be planned in that regard, thinking about it in those perspectives, right. can open some doors. Is, is that something, is that how it's being talked about in that square building? Well, you know, transit or each transit-oriented development in each neighborhood will in itself also be a destination, Yes. right? And if you look at all of the different neighborhoods and the diversity of our people, um, they can be um, very diverse in restaurants, you know, in stores and shopping. Um, I can see government offices and nonprofits and just uh, a slew of opportunities. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a small business person, uh, 
you will have literally not only the local people that will use the rail, but as you said earlier, the tourists. Mm -hmm. And with uh, close to 9 million tourists visiting our state, I'm going to guess easily one third of them will probably use the rail at one time or another. So and there's say, three it'll million a destination tourists. unto itself. Exactly. And as we have more spurs that go into more locations, we get out to the, uh, um, uh, yes, getting out to Kapolei, yes, going to uh, uh, Aloha Stadium, if we want to do that. But the other neighborhoods that are connected. Other neighborhoods along the way, because uh, some, absolutely. I, it, it just opens that door. Right. Possibility. And, and I could see those spurs. Those spurs don't have to be elevated. Um, from my perspective, you can have an at-grade spur that maybe goes um, from South Street, wherever it may go, or right. along Barracania or King Street at grade and thus saving money in uh, the long absolutely. run. Absolutely. And in some, in some areas, it's actually much more beautiful to really experience it at grade level as opposed to being up high. It, it much more ex experienced as you come through there. It's like, well, I'm not stopping. I'm not getting off at this stop, but you know what? I got to see this neighborhood as I went by. Right. And now maybe next time as a tourist, I'm going to come by, I will stop at that one yeah. as I go. So it's, it, it provides those, those glimpses into those communities as well. And um, getting back to what else I'd work on, yes. as you mentioned and we've stated, you know, I've been doing a lot on uh, police reform, law enforcement reform, prison mm -hmm. reform, justice matters, and, and that's an area that I also want to continue focusing on and concentrating on because Please do. we're talking about you know, the safety and security of our neighborhoods. Absolutely. And, and even more so. Well, it's um, not just that. I think maybe what you're going to, it's not just that. And as you and I have talked before, it's also about the number of local, specifically Native Hawaiian men and women who are, no, who, who are in prison, in jail, but sent off to the mainland somewhere. Exactly. Uh, rehabilitation is so important. Absolutely. A and we need to focus on you know, taking that individual who has made a mistake and, and, and help them to become a productive member of a society because everyone deserves a second chance. And all of us know, if not a family member, a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker who has been in trouble. Absolutely. And you know, if we can stop that revolving door, um, we can literally save millions of dollars in prison costs. Absolutely and, true. And if we find and different ways, if we have shorter terms in, that, they're, that they're in prison, because of a rehabilitation program, we found different ways of getting them and getting them back into, uh, and enculturated back into the society to be a productive member. Right. I mean, I, those conversations go on at multiple levels, and I, I thank you for, I know that you, it's been a big part of what you've been working on. And, and one area that I'd like to continue, um, safe zones. Safe zones. Right now, the city and state have not been supportive of safe zones for homeless. Yeah. Uh, so we're passing laws no sit and lie, you can't sit here, you can't lie here. We're pushing the homeless out of neighborhoods and communities, but there's nowhere for them to go. Nowhere for them to go. They end up coming right back there. And what gets hard to hear about, and we have to wrap it up in a minute, but what gets hard to hear about is when, um, from the neighborhood board level, when community members come up and talk about the fact that they keep seeing the homeless communities and they keep coming back and they want them gone, my immediate reaction is, well, we want them gone, yes, but what we want is to have them taken care of. We want to have the opportunity for them to be getting back on a path where they're taking care of themselves as well. And it can't be just a matter of sweep them out of the way or I don't want to see them. So having that housing solution and having a way to really approach that is a huge, huge challenge that we're working on. So. In closing, if I may, uh, please, if please. Uh, anyone would like to chat with me or have me attend a meeting, I'd be happy to, to share my thoughts. Uh, um, Two nine four nine zero seven three is my cell. There you go. So it, it's out there now. Two nine four nine zero seven three, and I'd love to talk to people about 2018 and hear their thoughts and see what they want to see our elected officials do. Excellent. Obviously, Excellent. that's what's most important to hear from our constituents. From our constituents, because we are representing them. Yes. That's right. Well, thank you so much. I thank truly you, Carl. appreciate it. I'm sorry that the show has to come to a close. Please, let's come back and let's schedule some some issue specific. Uh, uh, sessions in the, in going forward, and I would love to talk more about each of these. Um, so thanks again for joining us. This is Senator Willis-Barrett joining us. Thank you for joining us. 
to uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics and Hawaii series. We'll be back next week with, we'll, we'll, we'll finish out our, our Senate week with Senator Glenn Wakai next week. So we'll see you then. Thank you.